hey, we're in the middle of an epic giveaway. Make sure you've entered. Oh, man. Good night's sleep. A nice run to start the day. Yeah. Archer, you're already in here. Any news to report this morning? Let's see what's going on in the camera world. Wait. What? Nikon's announced a mirrorless camera? Just out of the blue? Like that? We've had uh, over a month of teasing and a few weeks of little leaks. We finally have photos, specs, and most of the answers. I say most because we really only have a few early hands-on reports. Hopefully in the next week we're going to have a lot more. And hopefully I'll be able to bring you my hands-on very soon. I'll say this, if you're on the fence about pre-ordering this camera, I mean, if, if the supply and demand situation is going to be anything like it is currently with the D850, that camera's been out for over a year and is still not consistently in stock. I would say go ahead and get your pre-orders in. You can always cancel them later if you hear something or decide something otherwise. But if you think you want this camera, you should pre-order it. So we're going to talk mostly about the Z7 that's available at the end of this month. And if you buy it bundled with their new 24-70 f4, that comes in at 4,000. Camera alone, it's about 3,500. We'll also talk about the lenses that have been announced and the roadmap. And we'll talk briefly about the Z6, which isn't coming until the end of November. So let's hit those important specs. This camera is going to be fully weather sealed on par with the D850, which is to say, Excellent. It's offering a 45 megapixel full frame backside illuminated sensor. It's very similar to what we have in the D850. When I did my hands on review of that camera, I found the image quality to be fantastic. So I'm excited. I think this will be very similar, if not a little bit better. We've got 4K 30 frames per second video with the option of in log in up to 10 bit when recording externally. Internally, just 8 bit, no in log stuff. And on the sensor, we've got 493 phase detect points. Now, this is a first for Nikon. This is at this size. We could say you have it in the smaller ones that the failed Nikon mirrorless. Now, if you're curious about how mirrorless focusing technology works versus DSLR, I wrote a whole complete overview of this. It's all available at the Photo Enthusiast Network. You can go read that along with tons of other great information on there. But uh, this is one of those questions that I really want to see in action. How does this focusing system work? Early reports is that it's quite good, even with the adapted lenses. And we'll talk about that in a minute. You also have five axis fiver. That's built in vibration reduction. So that's similar to the IBIS system. We're just different name, same idea, where the sensor itself is stabilized. Uh, it is lovely because older adapted lenses that don't have image stabilization or vibration reduction in them suddenly do because it's in the body. I will say that um, I've been able to get shots as slow as one third of a second handheld. And for a full frame camera, I think that's pretty happy. It sounds like the Nikon Z system will be as good but not quite as good as something like you'd get from Olympus, where there are reports of people hand holding that camera for up to six seconds when paired with the dual axis, dual image stabilization lenses. That's pretty impressive. Now note that five axis Vibber, it drops to just three axis when you use it with the adapter. So keep that in mind. The EVF, I don't know why I point to the Sony EVF when I mention the Nikon EVF, but it's a 3.6 million pixel EVF. It sounds lovely. Early reports say it's big, it's bright, it's got a good, uh, what is it, 60 hertz refresh rate, 60 frames per second refresh rate, and so in a good amount of customization of what you can display in there. The LCD on the back is 3.2 inch, 2.1 million. So very similar to the D850 with just a slight resolution difference or aspect ratio difference, truly. Uh, it is a fully touch, touch screen, fully touch. Menus navigatable. The uh, quick custom information menu can be customized and then touched to use. That's great. Sony, come on. All we got in the Sony is the touch to focus, which is useful, but I'd like to be able to navigate the menus with touch as well. Now, there are some you know, differences in how that uh, touch works in the different focusing modes. 
we'll report more on that soon. And also important to note that while some cameras like the Sony and even some of Nikon's like the D5600, when you bring the camera up to your eye, you can use the LCD on the back as a touch panel. That is not true in the new Z7. Uh, we've got, was it, eight frames per second, nine frames per second, uh, but that drops to maybe just six frames per second with continuous autofocus, and the buffer is a little on the puny side. Uh, just 18 full raw images before that buffer is going to start to fill up and slow down. I mean, these are big 45 megapixel images, but I've got my Sony a7R 3 here, and I don't know exactly what that buffer takes to fill up. This is RAW plus JPEG. That, that was more than 18 images, right? 36. So, and I didn't even, uh, it got bored of holding it down. Now, uh, a bit controversial here, we've got just one XQD slot. Now you could think of the XQD format as a successor to SD cards. They're more robust, faster, a bit more expensive. Some say maybe lots more expensive, but when you compare a fast SD card uh, to the XQD card, the, the price is fairly similar. Now, I mean, I said this is controversial because we have just one memory card slot. You've got those pros that say in 30 years, they've never had a memory card fail. One slot's enough. I'm not sure what memory cards they were using 30 years ago, but I've seen a comment like that. And then you've got the ones that said, just yesterday a card failed and I lost all of my bride's images. I will never take on a pro level gig without dual memory cards. I'd love to know your opinion. I have had cards fail. I've never had a card fail where either the images weren't recovered or it just you know, I lost images. I've never lost images from a card failure, but I've had PNY, SanDisk, and Lexar in cards all fail. I've had at least a couple of those different cards fall apart at different times as well. And here's the big one. I've got a GH5. I'm filming this on a GH5 right now. I took that on the recent Arctic trip. You can watch the video about that. And uh, one of the slots failed during that trip and no longer reads cards correctly. If that had been the only slot in that camera, that would have been a huge bummer on that trip. But because I had an extra slot, I was able to keep recording video. Now, I don't know what happened to that slot. I need to send it in and get it repaired. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. I've been filming on just one slot and gambling with this video. Battery life is rated at just 300 shots. Now, I know that sounds bad, but the A7R 3 is rated at just 600. I get far, far more shots from this. I almost always make it through a full day of shooting with a single battery. Uh, thinking back to the Arctic trip, tons of shooting, both photos and video, and maybe one or two days late in the evening, I had to put a second battery in. So I suspect the Nikon's gonna be much better than the 30 it's rated at, uh, but it doesn't sound to be as good as the Sony. Uh, it's nice that you could continue to use if you're, you know, 850 user, 7500. Basically, it's the EN 15L battery that they've been using for quite some time now. Uh, that's great. You can continue to use it. However, there's a new version of it, the B version. If you use that one, and that's what the camera comes with, then you can charge it via USB in the camera. So that's great. It's always nice to be able to charge in camera, uh, especially when battery life usually isn't as good as it has been in the past, or DSLR users, if you're moving from the Nikon D850, you don't use live view a whole lot, you might find this battery life to be fairly shocking. Um, but being able to charge USB on the go, USB-C, which is a nice, solid, robust connector, sounds great. It doesn't sound like you can power the camera over USB-C while you're using it. It's a charge function only. Now I wanna make a note that AF in general sounds very good, but there's no IAF. I just had to shoot a couple of portraits of a friend the other day for her new LinkedIn profile picture. And man, that IAF in the Sony just makes that so very easy. I've talked about it in the past too. I took some pictures of a friend's toddler. Bam, it just locks on. You don't have to worry about that. On the Nikon 7D Z7, Z7. It's going to take a while to get used to that. I don't hate it, but it just I just want to say D. There's always a D after Nikon and then letters. Um, 
you don't have IAF, you have a face detect. And that sounds very good. Uh, and overall, the autofocus system sounds good, but a good bit different from what we uh, are used to shooting with Nikon. Uh, and video focus sounds excellent, on par with Canon's Dual Pixel AF, which I consider the best out there. Now, the Z6, I mentioned it's not going to be released until November 30th. Same form factor, but you've got a 25 megapixel camera there, 273 phase detection autofocus points. It looks like this camera strength is going to be noticeably better in low light. It's also capable of up to 12 frames per second, but no word on buffer size. And much more affordable, body only at about $2,000. And with the 24 to 70, that's 2,500, 2,600, we round up truthfully. So we've got three lenses at launch. The 24 to 70 F4 comes in at 996, but if you buy it in kit, basically is only what, 400, 500? It's a good savings. Um, sounds like a decent lens. Uh, we've got a 50 and 35 millimeter f1.8 to come in at $600. Those also sound very nice and compact. And word of the development of a 55 millimeter f.95 lens. So fast, so fast, but manual focus only. So keep that in mind. Manual focus only at f.95. Have fun with that. The focus peaking should help, and this camera will have focus peaking. Um, and this lens looks beautiful. It's gonna have that little OLED indicator like some of the baddest lenses have. It's coming sometime in 2019. And we've got a full roadmap of all of these lenses coming. The, we could see 2019, 2020. A uh, couple issues, I don't see anything longer than 200 on the horizon. I don't see a macro on there as well. And you know, as good as the autofocus performance has been stated with the adapter, I'd be cautious about buying into this system if you need longer lenses until we hear more. I'm also really curious, what will we get from Sigma and other third-party lenses? Will they make their own adapter? Will they create native mount glass? Or the more immediate question, how will those current Nikon lenses, Nikon mount lenses, F-mount, that's made by Sigma and Tamron work with the current adapter? I'm gonna assume it's a bit hit or miss for now, but then again, that's a, you know, that's a wait and see question. Let's take a few moments and take a quick tour of the body. We're looking at the front here. We've got some customizable function buttons right down here next to the lens. I don't wanna be negative right off the bat, but I've had cameras with customizable buttons there and I so often forget about them. Interestingly, look at how big and gnarly the diopter adjustment is, or maybe we should start calling this the focus adjustment in the EVF. So that's nice. You're going to be able to really make sure that you easily dial that in. I also hope you don't easily hit it and knock everything out of focus. Often on workshops, folks will come up to me. They've accidentally adjusted their diopter and everything looks out of focus to them and they're trying to figure out why. Otherwise, we got we got have kind of a, a Nikon look here, and up until about the D850, I haven't loved the feel of Nikon cameras in hand. Uh, so I, I'm really curious to get my hands on this and see how it feels. Taking that lens cap off and looking at the front now, the big news that I haven't mentioned up until this point, and and maybe you've heard it, is the flange distance. Maybe you've never heard that before. It's not something I've ever spent a whole lot of time talking about, but it impacts kind of your corner sharpness and your corner vignetting, uh, with, especially with wider angle lenses. And there's been a lot of hubbub made about the Sony having a little bit more of a flange distance which limits its wider angle opportunities. I haven't actually found that to be true. I think less people are talking about it now because it doesn't seem to be so true. But it does point to the fact that you can have a 58 millimeter f.95 lens on here and you should have no vignetting right out to the edges. Basically, what we're talking about is the lens mount is just about right on top of the uh, sensor. And not only that, with this Nikon, we have a very wide diameter mount. It just gives some flexibility for the future and it's, it's all a good thing. How much it will really impact most of us well, I'm not exactly sure. Looking at the back, just a reminder, this is a fully touch screen enable. And unlike the D850 and other kind of pro level Nikons, we've got no buttons down the left-hand side. We're all over here on the right-hand side. Nice thumbstick, 
thumb joystick right there. Uh, not a whole lot of customizable buttons back here. Uh, so, you know, you're not going to be dialing in additional stuff to do for the most part. AF on, you can customize to a few different things. Looking down directly on top, one of the big differences we have is if we're comparing this against the Sony is we do have a little LCD. This is an OLED, OLED display up here on top. You also see we got a little speaker microphone. I know some people were uh, speaker grill. A little concerned about that, the fact that it's sitting on top. Uh, and, and you know easily rain could fall down into it I'm gonna assume Nikon knows what they're doing the D850 is a very weather sealed camera they report that this is as weather sealed so I'm gonna assume that they've taken steps to ensure that rain isn't gonna fall through the speaker grill I do like the integration of the OLED uh, for longer exposure or uh, in dimmer situations to not have to look at the back of the camera or the very big bright LCD to see your settings this is nice and then we've kind of got the standard on off switch and uh, custom or, and your kind of three buttons up here. Uh, the bottom of the camera doesn't give us anything interesting to note uh, other than a different kind of look at the grip. And they are working on a battery grip that will give us better performance at some point down the road. What did I forget? I mean, what are you most excited about? When do you think we'll hear from Canon with a full frame mirrorless that answers this Nikon camera and what Sony has had out for a while. And, you know, if you found this quick thoughts from me on this new releases helpful, give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe for more gear reviews, tips, tricks, and travel videos. And don't forget to enter that contest giveaway that's going on right now. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye. The blue like that. What?